Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this ICAS webinar, Tax Changes to Furnished Holiday Lettings, What You Need to Know, and Our Response to Government. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Clark. I'm the Assistant Director of Practice here at ICAS, and I have the pleasure of being your host today. The special tax rules for furnished holiday lettings have been around for a long time, 40 years in fact, and have enabled taxpayers letting out properties on qualifying short-term lets to claim special tax treatment. They've effectively been classed as trading businesses, giving tax benefits not available to rental businesses for longer-term lets. In the spring budget, the then Chancellor Jeremy Hunt announced the abolition of the FHL rules for residential property. This measure was aimed at preventing the tax rules, reducing the number of properties available for long-term rental by people in local communities. It's a subject that has generated a significant level of interest amongst our members in the subsequent months as you try to consider how the changes will impact them and or their clients. I say try to consider as we've been talking to our members about their concerns, especially about the lack of clarity in the announcement in the spring budget on transitional rules. It was therefore pleasing to see that alongside the first speech by the new Chancellor Rachel Reeves to Parliament on the 29th of July, that the government issued a policy paper and draft legislation on how the FHL rules will be abolished. This webinar will cover the changes and how they may impact you and your clients as well as give you the chance to feedback on the ICAS response to the government on the draft legislation. To help us explain or to explain and help us understand these issues, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleague, Chris Campbell. Chris will be familiar to a lot of you. He's the head of tax practice and OMB taxes here at ICAS. He's a chartered accountant and a chartered tax advisor and joined ICAS after a career in practice working with owner-managed businesses. He supports members with technical queries and represents ICAS and various HMRC stakeholder groups. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping matters to remind you of. You can submit questions at any time through the Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the top of your screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously and we'll be saving all your questions until the end of the webinar for the live Q&A session. Please also join in the conversation today through the chat box accessed at the top of your screen as well. This allows you to comment or discuss with fellow attendees on matters covered by the webinar. Um, we are, of course, recording it and we'll make it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or, or share it with others. And finally, the slides will be available on the events page on the ICAS website under the event listing. So we look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar, and we will try and get through as many of those as possible at the end. So I know that Chris has a lot of content to get through, so I'll pass straight across to him to get on with the detail. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all well, wherever you're joining the webinar from this morning. So just a quick overview of the topics that I'll be covering uh, this morning. I'll start with a little bit of a background. Jeremy gave a, a brief overview, just to his opening remarks as to the changes in the furnished holiday lettings rules that were announced in the spring budget. So we'll have a look at what happened in the spring budget and what's happened more recently with the draft legislation that was pu um, published back in the end of July. Before having a little bit of a think about some of the issues, it's not an exhaustive list, there might be others, uh, other issues that you might want to think about when advising your clients in the preparation for the changes that are coming through in the coming months. Before I request for some comments, that any comments that you may have in the, on the draft legislation, ICAS will be preparing a response along with other professional bodies to HMRC and there will be a chance for you to give your feedback, thoughts, concerns about the legislation itself rather than the, um, the, the merits of the or otherwise of the proposal. Uh, we more the technical aspects of the legislation that uh, we can take account of that in the ICAS feedback um, that is to be submitted to HMRC. As ever, there'll be a question and answer session at the end. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can if we run out of time, because there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, we've had a lot of feedback from members already on the subject. So I imagine there might be quite a few questions 
comments, observations, etc. So I'll we'll try to answer as many of those as we can uh, before we wrap up at 12 noon. So if we start with a background to the proposed changes. The furnished holiday let things rules have been around for a long time, since 1984. These are special rules um, on tax treatment. Essentially, as Jeremy said, given a, a trade status for various different tax purposes. So you're looking at being able to claim capital allowances on furniture and equipment, business asset disposal relief or entrepreneur's relief before that, achieving a 10% capital gains tax rate on qualifying gains up to the £1 million um, lifetime limit, the ability to claim holdover relief on gifts of furnished holiday letting property, uh, to qualify an asset for rollover relief, so either the sale of or using uh, the proceeds for uh, other qualifying assets being reinvested into qualified FHL property is currently on the list for rollover relief. It's also classed uh, the earnings from FHL property are classed as relevant earnings for pension purposes. They're not affected by the restrictions for finance costs for residential property for individuals, and they're also not affected by the special rules for jointly held property that's owned by spouses and civil partners. So at the moment, if the property is qualifying, and by that we mean 210 days uh, per year available for letting, actually letting for 105 days, and not normally let to the same uh, tenant for periods of more than 31 days. Um, there are various rules to get around that. If you don't quite uh, qualify, there's an average in election that you can use at the moment, and also a period of a grace election. So it's quite a lot of properties that are on the market at the moment for short term lets will qualify at the moment for furnished holiday letting treatment. Now, these rules for those of you who've been taxed as long as I have or possibly even longer, uh, you might remember that the, the FHL rules were nearly scrapped back in 2010. This was around about the time when I last had a change of party in government um, and there was a reprieve. So um, all that um, the change at that time was because of the European Union rules and the not being able to make a difference in the treatment of UK and EEA property. So they, they were going to get rid of the furnished hall to treatment altogether at that point. So there's been a reprieve um, back in when the change of government, they changed the criteria to the current uh, conditions. But I was waiting to see when the government changed this time to see if any changes, but no, there's not. There, we're full steam ahead and the rules are due for abolition in the in the coming months. So if we take a look back to the spring budget, um, that was when the announcement of the FHL regime being abolished uh, was made. It was made alongside the reduction in the 28% capital gains tax rate for higher rate taxpayers, which went down to 24%. But um, the detail at that point was very limited. So we knew that income tax changes were expected to take place through 2025. And uh, we knew, also knew that there would be capital gains tax anti forestalling rule uh, to take effect from the budget date on 6th of March. But we had very, very limited details. And that is probably why this is maybe been one of the subjects where we've had the greatest level of contact from our members over the last few months because the uncertainty this caused has created significant confusion about how the changes will impact clients carrying out genuine commercial transactions and how they would they get the 10% business assets disposal relief, could they roll over the gain into uh, another qualifying asset, if they gifted an asset um, that was a FHL property, could they get um, holdover relief and so on. Lots and lots of questions and lots and lots of unanswered um, questions that were left dangling over the summer until we had the draft legislation when Rachel Reeves stood up to Parliament on the 29th of July. A whole load of extra announcements were made alongside that and one of those was the HMRC published draft legislation, briefing paper, the tax information and impact note and an explanatory note which outlined how the changes will work in practice. The government is seeking feedback on the draft legislation by the 15th of September, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So what's changing? Well, there are going to be changes in income tax, 
corporation tax for those companies that have H FHL properties. And I think it's important not to forget that because in the initial announcements, there was lots of talk about the income tax rules, but very, very little talk about corporation tax and how companies more generally will be treated, for example, if you dispose the shares for capital gains tax. We also uh, see changes in capital allowances and the loss reliefs going forward. But what's not changed? VAT has been completely silent in any of the draft legislation. So at the moment, we're going on the basis that VAT notice 709 stroke 3 will continue to apply. And that says if you supply holiday accommodation or a site for such accommodation, you must account for VAT at the standard rate on any charges that you make, regardless of the length of occupation or the description of the charges. So that existing VAT treatment would, in the absence of any other change, continue to apply regardless of whether the property actually qualified for the furnished holiday letting rules under the criteria that I mentioned earlier. So two different regimes already in place, no plans as, I, as we are aware at the moment that could change. Um, and whether anyone has comments on that, we can, we can explore that uh, later on. What's also not changed is inheritance tax. Inheritance, the inheritance tax rules weren't terribly favourable when it came to furnished holiday lettings in any case. So if you look at IHT manual, IHT M25278, that already states that HMRC's view is that FHL properties wouldn't qualify for business property relief. Um, there's a POS in 2013 case that gives more details. They were looking for a significant additional level of services over and above the provision of the furnished holiday letting property. Um, and as such, because most properties, it is just the property that's let, most of them don't currently qualify for business property relief for inheritance tax in any case. This should not, however, uh, preclude any balfour type situations. Say if you've got an estate where they're, you're applying the wholly or mainly test for inheritance tax purposes on a desk. Now, I don't propose to go into that in any great detail, just to, to make, flag up the point that inheritance tax hasn't changed as a result of these uh, latest draft legislation. So what is changing in terms of income tax from the new tax year in 25-26, section 189, the Finance Act 2004, will be changed so that FHL income will no longer be treated as relevant earnings for pension contributions purposes. Now, we talked about pension contributions at a webinar we ran back in June. So if you've got any questions or uh, concerns on that, you might want to have a look at that to look at pensions more generally. But we've got the rules for personal pension contributions of the higher of 3,600 or 100% of net relevant earnings. So if you've got someone who's got um, their FHL business is the bulk of, or if not all their income, then they might, you might find that they don't have any net relevant earnings. So there's a potential cap when it comes to how much pension contributions they could make from 25, 26 onwards. Now that 3,600 has remained at that level for several years. I think if it was indexed in line with inflation, it would be well um, in excess of £6,000. Uh, but as ever with tax, some of these thresholds remain um, remain unchanged. And what 3,600 was when it came in um, is certainly a lot less than it, than it is now. But those are the rules as, as they currently stand. It's perhaps an observation that we could make to HMRC that they may want to um, revisit that. And, or give wider consideration about the impact of those taxpayers for whom this inability to make uh, significant contributions at the level that they have been in recent years could cause them issues going forward. Now, in terms of ITA 2007, there are two section numbers, uh, section 127 for UK properties and section 127ZA for EEA properties. They are going to be omitted from the legislation going forward, just to reflect the fact that the FHL treatment will be removed. Section 272B of ITOI 2005 currently um, has the exclusion of FHL properties from the restriction on finance costs. So if you've got someone who has got finance costs, say they've got some borrowing to buy the property, um, at the moment they would receive a full deduction if it was a qualifying FHL, it'll then go to the same position as any other residential property currently and the restriction will be uh, capped at the 20% the uh, fixed deduction. Section 311A of ITOIA uh, and the more positive side 
that's going to be updated so that the replacement of domestic items at the moment they are currently eligible for capital allowances and they that will be changing um as we'll see in the slide to uh, to come um, so it's the replacement of domestic items so at the moment you've got capital allowances can be claimed on any um additions for a qualified fhl property as long as it's um, qualified expenditure um but for a normal longer sorry for a longer term property let at the moment you would only be able to claim the replacement items um, under these uh, section 300 and 11a rules so that will be extended to include fhl properties so you'll there'll be an element of relief but it's not going to be as generous as it is currently for companies the rules uh, will be changing with effect of corporation tax accounting periods beginning on or after the 1st of april 2025 now that will be updated for similar provisions to the income tax rules so in the cta 2010 those are at section 65 for UK properties and section 67A for EAA properties. That will be omitted from the legislation and section 6, uh, 250A CTA 2009 will be updated similarly for the replacement of domestic items. So they'll be allowing for FHL properties going forward. Now, for those companies that don't have a year end that's the 31st of March, there are special transitional rules in place for year end struggling the 1st of April change, then you need to change, uh, you treat those as separate notional accounting periods and you would apportion um, accordingly. Now, the starting point would be section 1172 of CTA 2010, which is a time basis apportionment, but the legislation will allow um, adjusted and reasonable basis if you wanted to deviate for that, but it would need to be some valid, um, sensible reason to, to go for a reason other than time basis. For both unincorporated businesses and companies, there are capital allowances changes, and that is in Section 13B of the Capital Allowances Act 2001. That will no longer apply for FHL from the 1st of April for companies or the 6th of April for unincorporated businesses. FHL business will, left from that point onwards, no longer be a qualified activity for capital allowances purposes. However, on the upside, any expenditure that's been incurred before those changes take effect and are in a capital allowances pool will continue to remain within the capital allowances pool going forward. And this was something that we were really concerned at ICAST about, that there would be the potential for some sort of clawback of allowances, uh, balance in charge and so on. The, um, the draft legislation has made that really, really clear and that the capital allowances pool uh, brought forward will uh, continue to be claimed um, in the same way as it would always be. It's only any additions that would have happened after the changes came uh, take effect will no longer be eligible for capital allowances. But if it's a replacement of a domestic item, you have got the option to claim that relief um, on the replacement of an asset. That um, so it's not as it's it's a bit of a mixed bag. So anything thus far carries on for capital allowances. Anything going forward, not quite as good as as it was but certainly not as bad as it could have been. For um, capital gains tax purposes, um, they, we've got holdover relief section 165, a TCGA 1992, that's been updated to remove uh, reference to furnished holiday lettings as trading. Section 241, TCGA 1992 has been changed for UK properties and section 241A, TCGA 1992 uh, for EEA properties. Apology for the background noise. I think my postman's just trying to deliver something. Um, that'll be removing the special FHL treatment for rollover relief, holdover relief, business asset disposal relief, the relief for loans to traders, and the substantial shareholdings exemption for disposals by companies. There'll also be several minor consequential changes to remove FHL from other tax legislation. Um, as in when it's mentioned over the Acts, the Taxes Act. So when it comes to the capital gains tax change, most changes will take effect from 1st April 2025 for companies or 6th April 2025 for individuals. Always important to bear in mind for capital gains tax purposes, the date that a transaction takes place. Um, we've had some guidance on that on the ICAST website and articles earlier in the year. If anyone's got any queries on that, please do get in touch. 
Um, but there is an anti forestalling rule in place if the purpose of a transaction is to avoid the change in rules. And that will apply to transactions between the 6th of March 2024 um, and the above dates. And that's known as pre the pre commencement period. It will affect claims to rollover relief, provisional rollover relief, holdover relief, and business asset disposal relief. Uh, but it won't apply to genuine commercial transactions as long as there's not an intention to avoid the, the rules or any transactions between parties that are not connected. So the connected party definition is per section 286 TCGA 1992. And if you have a client who can avoid the anti forestalling rule, it will be necessary to make a con uh, statement that the conditions have been met to avoid that rule applying. Um, how that's going to work, I'm not quite clear in practice. It might be a case of ticking a box or a return or a need to make a white box um, disclosure for um, an individual tax return or a note in the corporation tax computation of the a company that's got a, a disposal in, in there. I mean, companies, not all those reliefs are applicable to companies, but rollover relief very much um, is with other reliefs to be for individuals only. Moving on to losses, the, we had a lot of questions about how this would work, um, because at the moment, FHL losses are currently treated as separate from any other property business. But going forward, the position might be a little bit uh, more straightforward insofar as loss is concerned because they're going to be amalgamated with other property businesses that are in place. So going forward, you'll still treat UK and overseas property businesses separately. So you have a UK property business that would be traditional property business and FHL merged going forward or an overseas um, FHL um, we go into an overseas property business with any other property letting that, that happens. Bear in mind that we could have properties, not necessarily that common, but from the EEA, um, there'll be properties on um, that would be eligible at the moment outside the UK that would become part of an overseas property business in future years. It might not necessarily all be bad because it might enable relief against property income that would have been the case had the rules not changed. But some things to think about when advising your clients. These are just some initial thoughts that you might want to bear in mind. We talked about the capital allowances changes and how if expenditure is within a capital allowances pool before the change, it will remain in the capital allowances pool after. So you can claim capital allowances in future years. It's important to bear in mind as well that there's the thousand pound small pool rule as well. So that might um, bring relief in in one go. Uh, as well. But in terms of any expenditure that might be planned, is there a way of accelerating that expenditure so that it takes effect before the rules change in April next year? Because once it's in the pool, it stays in the pool. Another thought is to explore whether a pension contribution could be made before the 5th of April. Now, it's won't be an option for everyone. Not every client will have the cash to make a personal pension contribution before that. And it's also important for them to have financial advice from a financial advisor who can best advise them on things, uh, not just tax, but other, other factors that they might need to think about as well. So as accountants and tax practitioners, we can't advise them on pension contributions um, beyond the tax treatment. And it's important for them to take the time so that it's not a decision to be taken at the last minute. So if it's something that a client is exploring, there is plenty of time now in August, less so once you get to March as uh, the as ever at the end of the tax year. And I suspect that this will make that even uh, busier going forward. We talked about the capital gains tax changes, but are there options for disposals to take place that won't fall file of the anti forestalling rules but before the 5th of April. Um, the subject that we've had some contact about is the effect of jointly owned property owned by spouses. Now, at the moment, it's not that uncommon for one spouse to be doing quite a lot of the work, 
um, and the, uh, for the furnished held um, all the letting property. Say, for instance, one spouse lives uh, nearby the property, another spouse has a day job, uh, they might currently share the income from that uh, furnished all the lettings business in a different um, ratio to 50-50. The necessary to complete a form 17 if the beneficial interest does not um, isn't 50 50 own between spouses so that they can share those uh, the income in accordance with the beneficial interest. Now, there is an article on ICAST.com that we did in the last few months on beneficial interest um, and spouses and, and the special rules that take place. Um, do you have a look there if you've got um, any initial? thoughts that you might want to explore further. Uh, we have had some contact in the Scottish context insofar as the beneficial interest being um, other than 50-50. Um, if there's something that you've cropped up, uh, it's cropped up in your practice, please do get in touch with me directly. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts and to see how we can help shape that. I'm aware of a legal difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK in the definition of beneficial interest, but the legislation from a tax point of view does apply on a UK wide basis. So happy to have a discussion um, or exchange emails with anyone who might want to, to do that um, after the webinar. I've put a point there about can the business become trading by other means? Now it could be that say for example that um, you could explore whether the proper, I mean, you might want to sell the property and use the money to do something else. And that's a possibility. Um, but if you've got ancillary items and alongside the furnished holy let, could they be given more prominence so that you can have a trade in business for the items in addition to the rental aspect? And, won't be an option for everyone. It's just something that I'm flagging um, to have a think about because it might be something for some clients to consider. And the last point in there, I've put, does a change in tax rules mean uh, a change in portfolio? And what I'm what I'm getting at there is all to do with the fact that some people might have their property portfolio in an FHL purely because of the tax rules. Now they always. I always like to think that the tax tail shouldn't wag the dog, but FHL, the rules were so advantageous that many people will have chosen to have FHL rather than longer term lets. And it may be that they might want to explore longer term lets. Um, I have heard that there are some councils when they had planning permission restrictions, which means that notwithstanding the tax changes, that property in some council areas or some properties in some council areas will have to remain um, furnished all the lettings. But if there's no restrictions um, that prevent a property being used for longer term lets, it may be the case that some clients will decide, well, actually, I'll, I'll go for the longer term rental option. Um, it, it'll very much depend on the property, what the FHL rents are um, versus the longer term security in, in, or perceived security of having income stream that's that's for a longer period of time um, just these are this list is by by no means exhaustive some initial things to think about um, when advising your clients so i've given an overview there um, in the last half hour or so on what the draft legislation looks like in its current form but we want to know your thoughts. How will this legislation affect you, your practice, your clients? Is there anything in there that could be worded differently? Are there any unintended consequences? We'd be really interested to hear, hear what you have to say on this because ICAS will be submitting a response to the consultation before it closes on the 15th of September. If you have anything that you would like to share, we'd be really pleased to hear from you. Now you can share your comments in, your, in the comments box just now if you want to do in the webinar. Um, alternatively, you can also get in touch with us by email and tax at icast.com. But please do either way uh, get in touch um, ahead of that deadline so that we can look at uh, in incorporating that and shaping the ICAST response to reflect the, the feedback from our members. And this is the reason why we're trying to organise this webinar in August 
to raise awareness of the legislation and give our members the opportunity to comment on the legislation and should they so wish. Now, that is the end of my part of the presentation. Um, Jeremy, I think you're going to come back on at this point. I think you're still on mute. Are you I, I noticed that. My mouse is too slow. Thanks very much, Chris. Um, I, but don't, I, don't, don't be going anywhere. No, um, I'm not going to be. No, I wanted to leave plenty of time for people to ask questions so that they don't have to listen to my dulcet tones for a, for the whole hour session um, uninterrupted. So, um, yeah, I think they're going to have to listen to you quite a bit here because I feel a bit like Clive Myrie and you're in the big black seat because I'm just going to ask the questions. Many oh, of dear, oh, dear, actually, oh, dear. Many of which I don't understand. So, um, yeah, there, there's actually been quite a few coming in. So I'm going to start with one um, which actually uh, you mentioned unintended consequences. And uh -huh. this this comment um I think might be one that's shared quite a lot by um, folk on the call and their clients. So um, this is not so much a question as a statement, but I would like to maybe get your reaction to it. We have a VAT registered rural business, which includes farming. We've two holiday lets, and by the time you deduct output VAT, cleaning, laundry and fuel, the margins are very tight. We cannot offset the farming losses against the diversification of the holiday lets. In short, the taxation changes make it unviable to continue the holiday lets. Farmers were encouraged to diversify and invest capital under one tax regime. There's no doubt this holiday let is a business requiring weekly attention and very different management from long term lets. The market has already slackened and government is now strangling the tourism market because some people are benefiting from tax breaks. Um, uh, like I say, I think that's probably going to be quite quite a common feeling, um, especially I, in the I, rural I think community. So, Jeremy. Absolutely. And I think the problem that we have with the change is it's applying across the board. And I think the words, uh, some members of parliament raised this on the in the House of Commons before the general election to say, was there a possibility of making a distinction? Now, the then government um, wasn't keen on that. Um, I don't think, because there's been a change of government, that there's any reason why that point couldn't be made again. Because I can see, and I've heard examples from members that I've been speaking to who are in rural areas or who have clients who have properties in rural areas, how important these furnished holiday letting tenants are to the local economy in terms of the um, you know continued um, bringing in of investment. You know they're arriving with their money, they're spending money and businesses in the wider community in the rural economies, um, particularly so in Scotland, but there will also be parts of other parts of the UK where the same issue would equally apply. Um, and it's, it, I can totally understand how clients will have made decisions based on the information at the time. You know, sometimes it might have been building a property on a farm or, or even in, I know, I know in some um, very remote parts there were sort of crofting type schemes that you could apply for grants to build these these properties very very close to um, where um, I'm otherwise lacking profit uh, low profitable or loss making business exists. Um, but I think I, I have heard that message um, from a lot of people I've spoken to. I, yeah, I completely agree with you. It's not a lone voice, and I will see how we can make representations on that, but it it becomes difficult when the technical aspect strays into the political. But I think it is important to flag it's a practical aspect as opposed to a political point that businesses have made decisions in good faith based on the rules as they were at the time, and the playing field is perhaps changing ever so slightly in a way that might be completely different to communities that they can't get housing and um, there are many rural areas where the FHL changes are seen as a bad thing rather than open and open opportunities and, and perhaps it's something we, I dare say we could probably fill and I were talking about that subject alone because there's lots of yeah. um, permutations of it. So, so it's one of those um, 
government policy, not quite joining up with some of the other things they're trying to achieve and actually in some areas making it worse rather than better. But um, a couple of slightly more technical ones, if you like. Um, what is HMRC stance on a couple who own a number of H, I'm sorry, FHL properties and rent the properties to a limited company to run the trade? Is that going to be affected? So the, going on that, um, and the, the the person who's asked the question can 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 come back if if I'm not picking this up so, uh, scenario up correctly. So it's the furnished holiday letting is being within the company. So that because the company rules are changing, the the I think, company, I think I think what it is is that the individuals own the, own the property. They then rent it to a limited company, which then rents yeah. it on. So, yeah, so, so the rent, yeah, so the rental to the company wouldn't be FHL anyway, because that would just be a, a general let. Um, the company wouldn't own the property because it's been rented. So the it, it, but it would cease to be it would cease to be classed as a trade within the within the company. Okay, doc. Um, uh, what you might want to bear in mind is if the company was being wound up that you might be able to explore FHL treatment for the shares in that company. Now we've got to be careful of Phoenixism um, rules. So if you sort of liquidate a company and then set up another one doing different things, how that works with FHL we need to be explored a little bit further um, and that would be an interesting technical point. Um, what HMRC has said in, on capital gains um, we, for both companies, which shares in companies which are FHLs, the trade ceases before the, the rules change that you'll still have the normal three years to dispose um, and that would apply to the property as well for held by individuals. So what at this point isn't clear is that is, is there a deemed disposal on in April, uh, or sorry, a deemed cessation of trade, I beg your pardon, uh, from which you then have three years to, to sell the property. That bit is, is, is somewhat um, unclear, and I'll be looking at um, included in an ICAS response to HMRC. Yep. We've got a couple of questions actually around about anti forestalling. So I know you did a, a whole slide on them, but there's probably yeah. more to it. So um, the first one, are there anti forestalling rules around accelerating capital allowance investment before the end of March 2025 um, for expenditure, which would have been planned after that date if these rules weren't to apply? So you're bringing it forward into 2025 tax year. Um, um, no, the, the anti forestalling rules is on, is, as per the draft legislation, is in respect of the capital gains changes. Um, the capital allowances rules that would normally apply continue to apply on the timing of expenditure. What I would suggest um, anyone that's looking at that just to be aware of the general anti avoidance rules that are in the capital allowances act so that you can't change, manipulate the date to reflect um, a situation other than the commercial reality. But by accelerating expenditure, these are things saying, well, actually, I was going to buy it next year. I am buying it this year. Um, the, the intention to buy it next year doesn't change the fact that you have bought it this year, if, if that is indeed the case. Uh, whereas you can't, um, the existing legislation wouldn't let you bring forward, say, for example, you try to do some clever paperwork um, to manipulate the rules to get it in, that would be viewed quite um, carefully. So, so no, no separate anti forestalling rules uh, in place, but normal rules for capital allowances will apply. And happy to answer any questions. I'm pretty sure I wrote an article on the timing of um, capital allowances rules um, on the ICAST website um, about a year ago. So, uh, but happy to point anyone in that direction if they. So, if you're like going to do it, if you're going to do it, do it soon. <laughs> Yes. Indeed, and do, and do it properly. <laughs> yeah, another one on um, anti forestalling. So if a client wants to now sell their FHL as a result of the legislation changes, if this is a third party commercial sale that completes before the 1st of April 2025, 
then this doesn't fall under the forestalling rules. Is that right? So you have to be careful because the way the le draft legislation is worded is that it's not it's not to be a transaction that's designed to avoid the rules. And either it's a genuine commercial transaction or it's a transaction with someone that's not a commercial, it's not a connected person. So where you've got a sticky wicket is in the first test, which is many people will be doing transactions before the 5th of April next year. And if HMRC can challenge the fact that the only reason for the transaction is to avoid the rules. Now, it may, there will be many transactions that would have been happening in any case. For example, someone's retiring and selling up their FHL business that they spend a lot of their time, as you said earlier on, there's quite a lot of, there's quite a lot of work involved with the short-term lets, the changes between lets, a lot more onerous on the person running the business than a long-term let. So here we need to be exercised in terms of the facts and how they're presented to HMRC. And as I mentioned on the slide, there's going to be, I need to be a statement to say why you think the anti forestalling rules don't apply. And is it's not viable anymore, a, a legitimate reason? Well, they haven't, yeah. they, they, haven't, they, haven't, they, haven't, they haven't defined that, but um, I think that would be one I would be so that would be a commercial reason that, and that's a very, very good point. Could the fact that the rules are changing affect, you know, I, I, I think that would be open to exploration. Um, there'd be no guidance because, because they've li had limited guidance on how that anti first ruling rule will apply. At least we know what the rule is because that was yeah. the thing. We didn't know what the rule was in the budget in the spring. Uh, so we've had several months of not knowing what the rule is, how HMRC will apply it and whether they could challenge a particular transaction um, is the next step that, that we'll try to see if we can get some more clarity on. Okay, one on pension contributions before April 2025. I know we don't do pensions per se, but yeah, um, this is a sort of, um, is this an issue if a company contribution and the accounting period straddles April 2025, so in both years? It, it shouldn't be in respect of uh, company contributions. And we spoke about that, the difference between the tax rules for personal contributions and company contributions, which are different um, in respect uh, of the webinar that we run, I think it was back in June, um, where we looked at a lot of those things. So uh, as I... Um, mentioned earlier, I would encourage anyone to have a look at that webinar um, or to get in touch if there's any particular areas that people have queries on that uh, beyond that. But that it, it, the 100% the, the net relevant earnings is a personal pension contributions issue as opposed so to a reportable. Company one, yeah. Okay, um, would forming a partnership be a way around jointly owned spousal property if the aim would be to potentially change the profit split year on year. So it's a commercial reason for doing it. Very good question. Stick that one to the wall. <laughs> we'll come back. It's to a very good question. <laughs> what I would say on that one is, is that um, you don't want to find that you create more problems than you solve from a tax point of view. Um, in, in respect of, um, you know, it might be a relatively small issue in the grand scheme of things, but there are other tax issues involving partnerships and, and property and all the rest of it that we might want to to be aware of. Um, whether or not if it was someone other than a spouse, you know, would you get holdover relief if the, the intention to gift. So say if it was brother, sister type scenario, I must wait, sorry, the 50-50 rule only applies to spouses. So you could transfer, you could transfer um, no gain, no loss between spouses in any case. So that's perhaps less of an issue, but you might find that there's other other tax issues at play. It would depend on the scenario. Um, I'm happy to 
answer any more detailed questions on that off offline if anyone would like to get in touch with me. Okay, one on um, interest restrictions, you mentioned that that would change. Um, yes. I assume that there are currently no transitional provisions in place in respect of the restriction to loan interest costs like they did when they introduced the when they restrictions it, yeah. to uh, loan relief for resident, yeah. long-term residential lets. Uh, yeah, the, the the legislation as it currently applies, uh, draft legislation does not. It just it just says that um, the exclusion Bang. for <laughs> FHL will uh, will no longer apply. Apply. Bang. <laughs> That's yeah. It. Um, yeah. But I think it's a very good point, and I, I would quite like to have a think about how we could illustrate that point to HMRC when we when we make our submission. There's some really good points coming through here, actually. And possibly another one. Um, how does the timing of expenditure eligible for capital alliances affect the application of alliances in respect of pre-FHL business commencement and super deduction rules? I must admit that I haven't a clue what that means, so I'm hoping that you do it. I'll read it again, give you time to think. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. How, how does the timing of expenditure eligible for capital alliances affect the application of alliances in respect of pre-FHL business commencement and the super deduction rules? Now, I don't think the draft legislation talks at much length about that um, because it's the way that it's worded considers existing businesses and how they will be treated going forward. So I think it would depend on whether or not the FHL business commenced before the change of rules. So if it ha if the rental happened after the rules changed, then I don't think well because it's treated as expenditure on the normal rule is the pre commencement capital allowance and expenditure would be treated as expenditure on day one. So on day one of a business, if it was after April, it wouldn't be eligible for capital allowances. Um, I don't know about if you're a company uh, for the super production, it would need to be the comp a company that was doing that. I don't know how that would, I don't, I don't, I think that's a technical nuance that they haven't explored in the draft legislation. Um, but trying not to overcomplicate matters for the purpose of general application of the rules, if, if it's not trading before the rules change to say that FHL is no longer a trade, then I think you'd be struggling to get any allowances. Okay, I think we've got happy to skip that for further. A couple of questions here, which are the same question. So I'll read them both. Can you claim replacement of a domestic item on the replacement of an asset you have previously claimed capital allowances on? And I think this is the same question. If you've claimed capital allowances on an asset, then you later, once the rule change, you replace it. Can you get replacement of domestic item relief on the new item? So it is the same question, just from two different folk. Two different folk. Um, my understanding would be that you should, because you've not got the ability to claim capital allowances. Not that there's a trade off, is that you're not. It, if it was the first item, you wouldn't get it, but because it's a replacement item, you should get it. Um, would be my um initial thought um we would i would need to see the final wording of the section number once the final legislation through to be completely clear on that um because but i suspect it will not refer to capital allowances because generally speaking you cannot claim capital allowances for a long-term let at the moment on residential property it's only this exception that assets in a FHL business, that FHL business is a qualifying activity for capital allowances purposes in the way that the longer term letting of residential accommodation is not currently. So there's been the same rules um, throughout. Yeah. Okay, there's still plenty of questions to go, Chris. Oh, that's so we're good, not, that's we're, good. We're not running I, out, we're not I'm, running I'm out. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad um, I, I deliberately made um, the presentation part as short as I could make it whilst covering as many of the points as possible, just to um, to flesh out 
on some of the uh, more detailed points and to see what problems people are anticipating. So this is all really, really good stuff. Yeah. So um, in the new regime, how does FHL changes deal with um, FHL partnership where only one spouse is a partner, but the property is jointly owned by the husband and wife? Will the Form 17 declaration take care of that? So you've got a property owned by husband and wife, um, but only one of the partners um, trades it as a FHL through a through a partnership, presumably with somebody else. I think we would need to. I'll, I'll need to look at that point. I'm happy to follow. Tricky one. <laughs> I, just, I just need to get my head around the practical points of of what's happening there. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to make sure I've covered things. And I'm not even sure because I have no idea what this is. So if it's not related, I hope it is given um, <laughs> that the, the, the user that's put it in seems to have other good questions on this matter. So what happened to the bright line test previously proposed by the Office of Tax Simplification? Um, is that one of the things that went the way of the Office of Tax Simplification yeah, and so, so, uh, down the drain? Yeah. That was that's one of the few things that survived from the mini budget of twenty twenty two was the abolition of the the tax simplification um office of tax simplification is now gone, but HMRC has got a duty to consider tax simplification when it's making policy announcements. So um I don't think anything I, th I think that just I mean that doesn't appear to be taken account in the draft legislation. Um, I am aware that the OTS did look at the furnished holiday lettings and how it could be simplified. Um, clearly, the government has thought that getting rid of it altogether is simplification. Um, but, yeah, no, um, I haven't seen that particular point coming through in the, in the draft legislation. That's okay. a good point. Yeah, um, a lot of these ones we will do a question and answer thing afterwards. I think Chris and you can yes. um, yes, go into it in a bit more detail. Um, Absolutely, and also some of them are quite left field, so um, not not surprising that uh, in the black chair you're um, taking the taking the fifth, and I'll come back to you on it. So this might be one of those. Um, will the domestic item relief follow the definition in the property income manual? I would expect it, there would be no change because the only thing that's changing is the fact that FHL uh, property addition and um, items in an FHL property will qualify for that relief. Haven't seen any um, indication that there's going to be any change to what those items are. Okay. Um, going going back to the pension one and the the company uh -huh. pension contributions. Um, so. Um, you mentioned that the traditional rules straddling um, April 25 would be on a time basis. So if a company has a November 25 year end, but makes a company pension contribution in March 25, so before the changes, um, is the whole pension contribution allowable for corporation tax because it was made before the changes? I, I, I don't... I... I don't think we should overly get concerned about companies because the pension change that we talked about is more for individuals. Um, the timing of I don't the the I don't think I don't think that the I mean the the, the trans the notional periods was all to do with whether or not you could claim the company could claim capital allowances, whether it would be classed as a trade. Um, pension contributions can be made by a company in different ways. So I think that's perhaps something we might want to follow up on uh, as an article separately, because I think we've had a few people asking about questions on the difference between employee and company contributions and personal contributions. I think that's something that we were easily flushed out um, on an article and uh, that we can then cover off in a little bit more detail. 
Okay. So have a look at that. We've got one more that's coming in the Q and A, and then we've got some others. Um, I don't know whether you want to keep going for a bit, or are we allowed to run over? Um, we 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 can do we can do. Um, I, th I as you say, I think we're going to follow up on after this with a a document of the the questions and the common themes that are okay. coming through. Um, so can I cast consult with HMRC to get clarity on the anti forestalling rules, and whether yes. a forced sale now. Um, because the running of the FHL would no longer be financially viable, um, you know, is that something we will raise with them just to try and get clarity yeah, on that? I, I think so. So what, cause what we're doing when we're, when we're given a response, it's, it's a consultation without questions almost. So what we can do is we can say the wording of the legislation is this, this is a potential outcome that our members have reported and flag that up. So I yeah. think um, I can't make any promises, guarantees that will have any impact, um, but it's HMRC that it's going to. So and even if the legislation doesn't change, there might be the option to have some guidance or clarity that, that might change okay. or make things clearer for people. Yeah, right. So we've got four questions that came in before the, mm -hmm. the webinar started by email by folk that couldn't join us today, but we'll hopefully pick up the recording after. So um, I think you answered this one on the way through, but are there any plans to change the treatment of FHL for VAT purposes? Uh, no, not at the moment. Um, I think the HMRC um, could perhaps help give a bit of a clearer picture for people by explicitly saying that the VAT position isn't changing, but as at, as at this moment, the rules are not the same and they haven't made any announcements. It's, there's nothing on VAT in the draft legislation. Okay, cool. So if you've got um, properties in the UK and overseas, how will the losses be treated going forward once the FHL yeah. rules have been abolished? So once FHL comes through, the FHL losses will be amalgamated with the existing property business. But what's not changing is that if you've got a UK property business and an overseas property business, they'll be kept separately. So if you've got UK and long term uh, UK properties that are FHL and long term, and overseas EEA properties which are FHL and long term, the overseas properties for both will become part of the same business and any losses amalgamated in there. And the UK properties will become one UK property business and any losses in there. So FHL losses could perhaps uh, be offset against property income from other lets when they would not be able to currently. Yeah. So it's not Two necessarily more. all bad news. <laughs> no, absolutely. Two more very quickly. So yeah. If um, clients have a portfolio of holiday lets and it amounts to their full-time occupation, it seems a bit harsh that their pension contributions are going to be capped um, going forward. So is it right to assume that unless they demonstrate a trade, so do more than listed um, above, like just holiday lets, but provide horse rides, farm tours, um, that sort of thing, um, there'll be no exceptions to that? That's going to be the, the yeah, line, I, mean, I feel like? Yeah, it's yeah, I, I, it's it's a really good question, and I I think first of all, yeah, I, I agree. It does seem harsh, but that is how the rules are currently worded, because they're just removing FHLs from the definition of income that counts as relevant earnings for pension purposes. What um, I suspect people will then need to explore going forward is how. Can any ancillary things, can, is, is, is there more to that or can they expand that so that those activities, even if the FHL bit is no longer trading, can those activities be classed as a trade and then therefore relevant earnings for, for pension purposes going forward? But if it's just pure FHL and there's nothing extra on the side, I think some people are going to have some really, really tricky conversations if, as individuals they are making pension, pension contributions. contributions. Okay, and final one, your two and a half minutes of the, the, the black chair and almost up. For um, business asset disposal relief, how will this work in terms of the normal three-year period following cessation in respect of FHL business 
which has ceased before the new rules take effect. So will it apply? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so so what HMRC in the explanatory notes with the, the legislation, they covered this point and they they have made clear that if your business ceases before the 5th of April, say if you're your individual, you have an FHL property, it ceases, it ceases today, uh, but you take some time to sell the property, depending where you are in the UK, um, if there's a planning restriction on it to say you can only be used as FHL, that might make things trickier. Um, some properties will sell quickly, some properties won't sell quickly. There'll be various reasons why it might take longer. So the normal rules for business asset disposal relief will apply. And the fact that the FHL treatment in itself has will cease when the new rules kick in won't affect that. Um, but uh, you've got to remember other things, it's got to be um, there's no, a lifetime limit, so that it's business asset disposal relief isn't always available, even if it would qualify. So there's other factors at play that um, tax agents might need to look at when advising their clients. Well, well, thank you. You've you've taken everything I've thrown at you with uh, remarkable calmness, and um, <laughs> if we haven't answered any questions that are coming in still. <laughs> um, we will look at them um, and put them in the Q&A document afterwards, but I think we need to draw a line now. It's well past 12 o'clock and some people have dropped off. Well, remarkably, we still have um, well over 100 folks still with us. Um, so thank you, everybody, for staying with us as well. Um, please remember, you can keep up to date with all the latest tax and other professional news, including latest information guides and resources on ICAS.com. And you can access technical support through the ICAS Technical Help Desk, um, which covers audit and accounting tax, practice support and ethics. And it would be great if you could leave us a rating for today's webinar. Please don't mark us down for going on a wee bit. Um, there will be a poll appearing on the screens now or in the chat box at the top of your screen. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. Um, before logging off. Um, looking ahead just very quickly, we have a range of webinars in the weeks ahead which you might wish to sign up for. On the 5th of September, we have a periodic review amendments to UK GAP. What does this mean for me? If you don't want to do it online on the 5th of September, there's an in-person option on the 18th of September um, at CA House in Edinburgh. Um, on the 17th and 18th of September as well, we have the ICAS Insolvency and Restructuring Conference online, sponsored by Sweeney Kincaid. And on the 26th of September, Making Tax Digital for Income Tax, Get Your Practice Ready. And finally, one in person, one um, in, in next week or the week after, 4th of September, the two Ethels celebrating pioneering women in tax and accountancy. Um, it's a Women in Tax event held in Edinburgh, again, in person at CA House. So it would be lovely to see you there. So um, links to sign up to all the ICAS events are available at icas.com backslash events. So it only leaves me once again to thank you, Chris, for your excellent insight and um, for answering all the questions. For those of you um, who have stayed the course, thank you very much. I do hope that the webinar has been helpful. Um, thank you for joining us. And until next time, goodbye.